Welcome back. In this video we'll be talking about the concept of art. It seems reasonable since we're going to be talking about art um, to want to define it. What is it that we believe this word means? Um, what's your personal understanding of art? What's our cultural concept of art? Um, and so we just want to try to pinpoint that before we go back looking at other cultures and their ideas of art. When we go to an art museum today, um, I guess when we want to go see art, we go to a museum. So we, there are places like museums and galleries for us to go and see art. And we might see a wide range of objects. We might see a realistic painting like this, a landscape by George Innes. We might see a non-representational image like this one by Joan Mitchell. We might see in a museum today a hyper-realistic, uh, monumentally sized sculpture like this one by Ron Weck. Uh, where you believe this person might, you know, you might look closely to see if she's breathing. It looks so believably real. Or a non-representational installation like this one by Tomas Saraceno. So these are four really different type of, of works and images, very different processes, and yet we call all four of them art. Um, so what is it we mean by that term? To get started, we're going to play a little game, you could say, um, called Is It Art? Why or Why Not? And I'm going to show you several pair of images. And with each one, I want you to ask uh, or answer, is it art and why or why not? The whys are really important because you want to get to the issues that help you decide when, or, uh, when something is or is not art. So here's our first pair. There's a life-size marble figure on the left and a miniature bronze casting of the work on the left there on the right. Are either of these art, neither of them, one or the other, and why are I not? So pause here for two to five minutes to jot down your thoughts. Our second pair are these. An oil painting on the left of a woman. Is that art? Why or why not? How do you know? And on the right, a postcard of an ink drawn, uh, or postcard, sorry, of the same image with ink drawn facial hair. So she's got a mustache and a goatee. And the letters at the bottom, L H O O Q. Are either of these art or neither of them? Why or why not? A third pair. On the left, we have an arrangement of leaves. And on the right, um, someone holding up a single leaf. Are either of these art? Why or why not? And a fourth pair. On the left, a vase from ancient Greece. It's that art. And on the right, a mug with an NPR logo. It's that art. Okay, so pause if you need to to solidify your thoughts on each of these. Have some specific reasons why things do or do not qualify as art in your understanding. And then we'll walk through them together. Often when we look at these two images, <coughs> um, students are quick to say that the image on the left is definitely art. Um, it is a life-size marble sculpture, so we're really impressed with the skill and technique that it would take to carve marble to look like this. Um, there's also an interesting expression going on here. Um, in this case, we know that it's the, the figure of David, the biblical um, hero, David. And we know that that theme has been done before this. So Bernini's not the first one to do David. Certainly Michelangelo and Donatello before him did sculptures of David. But John Bernini, or sorry, John Lorenzo Bernini did David in a really interesting, unique way. He did it in motion. So just as David's about to release that slingshot. So there's skill and technique. There is um, expression in this. Um, there is uh, uh, kind of art um, valid materials. So we're very used to looking at marble sculptures as artworks as opposed to, say, uh, a similar sculpture out of toothpaste. We might be less inclined to declare it as art. But there's something about marble that goes back to the ancient world as a valid art material. So we're very convinced about the image on the left. Now on the right, I sometimes get mixed reactions. Um, some of you might have thought, well, if it's just a casting of the image on the left, it's just a reproduction, then it's not really an artwork on its own. It's not an original piece, right? We do value originality. 
Um, and so in this case, this piece is not original in its form, meaning it doesn't look different than the other. And it's also not really original in its content. So those are two different types of originality. Originality of form is what it looks like, so it doesn't look like something new. And originality of content, it's not telling us something new. Um, in this case, the image on the right is really done just as a reproduction, um, just to be sold as a souvenir. And it's um, you know approximately uh, probably 12 to 18 inches high. It's a bronze casted image. Um, of the original. So this is the kind of thing that when you travel to Italy and you've seen Bernini sculpture in person, you want to buy a souvenir, you might buy this, you know, in the gift shop of the museum. So we would actually say the image on the right is not considered a work of fine art. Um, it still, I guess, is in the general heading of the art world. It is a visual piece, but we would call it a reproduction. It's not the kind of thing you would see um, heralded in the museums. Our next pair you probably recognize right away the image on the left um, by Leonardo da Vinci, the Mona Lisa. This piece, it does have some of those same qualities. It does have skill and technique. Um, it again is very, um, has a typical uh, art valid material in the sense that it's oil paint on canvas. And so definitely since the Renaissance and a little before, we've seen oil paint as um, as a, a valid material for art, as a sure sign that something is art if it's made with those materials. Um, but I think here too, I think it's always interesting that even for people who maybe know nothing about art, maybe aren't even interested in, in art, they usually know this image. This image is world famous, internationally recognized. And why is that? Don't you wonder? I mean, it's a 500 year old uh, painting of a woman. We're not totally sure of her identity. Why is this piece so famous? We could um, point to a lot of different things. You know, every couple of years there's a new documentary about why this piece is so special. Um, so maybe you've heard some of the, the theories behind it. But I think in general we could say that there is the um, authority of the art world, we'll call it. The authority of the art world. Meaning art historians, art critics, um, vouch that this is an important artwork for our culture. And even going back to closer to the time that it was made, of course, Leonardo da Vinci was a very exceptional, very important artist. Even in his own day, he was affirmed by the art critics of his own time. Um, so it has the authority of the art world behind it. You just, you know it's an artwork, even if you can't fully express why, because the art world has affirmed it as such. Now what about this image on the right? It's a reproduction, so that sounds like it wouldn't be an artwork. It is not very original in form, right? It's kind of, uh, you could say it's a ripoff or it's a commercialized image based on the Mona Lisa. Um, we're not impressed with the skill and technique here, right? He just, uh, this person bought in a postcard of the Mona Lisa, drew on it, wrote some letters. So all these things seem to count against it in terms of if it could be an artwork. And yet, some of you might have known already or might have guessed, this one actually is a little different. This one was made by an artist named Marcel Duchamp. So Duchamp is intending it as an artwork. So we could write down the artist's intent as one uh, quality, one um, issue in the defining concept of art. Um, the artist intended to make this as an artwork. And he knew that he wasn't making it very original in form or very impressive in terms of skill and content. Um, but he chose the postcard intentionally because choosing a postcard would add meaning to the work. The idea that the Mona Lisa is the kind of image that is reproduced constantly in postcards and posters in Duchamp's day, so this is the early 1900s, um, or certainly in our day, you, you would find it all over the internet, you find it in TV, sitcoms, it's even been in The Simpsons. Um, so he wanted to comment on reproduction, so he needed to use an, art, an image that was reproduced. Um, and he's also trying to, uh, I think, rile us up a bit. He's trying to be provocative. And a lot of people can look at this image and be very upset and feel like he has um, almost vandalized the, the real Mona Lisa itself, um, that it is in some way kind of derogatory, perhaps, or at least um, critiquing this very famous artwork. And I think that much is true. Um, I think he is trying to be a bit provocative um, drawing a mustache and you know facial hair on her, 
But there's an interesting hint in the letters down below, L-H-O-O-Q. If we try to pronounce that in English, it just phonetically, it would sound like look, right? So it's sort of a command, look. But also, apparently, if you pronounce it letter by letter in the French, um, it sounds similar to a sentence that would mean she's, uh, basically, she's got a hot butt. Um, so also a very cheeky, very um, kind of sarcastic or perhaps derogatory sentence. Um, but what is he trying to draw us to with this bit of humor, with this bit of uh, um, uh, kind of uh, fresh approach? I think he's trying to ask the question, even in 1919, and I think we can still ask it today, um, why is this image and Renaissance images, why are they so um, important and so heralded? And are we to always try to make Renaissance work? So in 1919, he still felt like the, the, um, the trend was to make Renaissance style art, that that was still defined as the best type of art out there. And he felt like, you know, now that it's the 20th century, we have all kinds of technology, we have industry, we have electricity, we have a whole different lifestyle and different culture than the Renaissance um, people did and yet we're still supposed to be making Renaissance style art. And so he's really questioning, um, is it time to move on? You know, we're in a different culture, maybe there should be new ideas in art now. Um, so we do usually think of both of these as being part of the art world. Uh, the Mona Lisa is such an interesting image. Um, we do tend to revere it a lot. And on the other hand, you can also see images like these, the Mona Lisa on a t-shirt, on a cocktail napkin, on an umbrella. And it's interesting when we look at these kind of souvenirs, few people complain about them being um, disrespectful or something. And yet when Duchamp made his piece on the postcard, people were really upset about it. Um, it's interesting though, because I, I would tend to think that putting her on the cocktail napkin <laughs> or on these t-shirts and umbrella is actually also a sign of disrespect. Things that we really high, highly value, we shouldn't usually make into kind of these mockeries of itself, right? Um, not only Duchamp, but also another artist like Andy Warhol, about 50 years after Duchamp's L-H-O-O-Q, um, made another piece. Of course, Andy Warhol's living in the age of uh, television and mass photography, and, and so he also was able to comment in a new way about reproduction and how sometimes reproduction of an image can desensitize us to it. The more we see it, the more it loses meaning. Uh, perhaps. All right, on to our next pair. The arrangement of leaves versus a single leaf. So think about what she said. Um, a lot of people are tempted to say that all of nature is art, um, especially if we are believers, we might say like, oh, well, all of nature is God's art. Um, and I think that's a beautiful metaphor. We could also say all of nature is science, right? Um, all of nature is poetry. We might make these kind of statements that are really beautiful and trying to give God credit for all that we see and, and feel. On the other hand, uh, those statements are much more powerful as metaphors than they are as actual definitions. So truly, God is well beyond our human disciplines. He's bigger than the discipline of art. He's bigger than the human understanding of science, right? So we're actually going to define art as something man-made or man um, arranged, let's say, um, because here certainly on the left, Goldsworthy is using natural materials. He's using these leaves that he found in the woods. He meticulously searched them out, organized them, and arranged them in this order. So man, it's man-made in the sense that he um, selected these pieces, these materials, and arranged them for us. Um, he again had that artist intent to make an artwork, to create this expressive piece, and it is um, fairly original in, in form and concept. On the right, the single leaf, I would say no. Here, this is just, uh, was an example for our class, for our discussion. In this case, although I suppose you could say it was selected, nothing's been done to it, nothing's been altered in it. Um, uh, it wasn't really intended as an artwork. Um, so I wouldn't say a single leaf on its own is an artwork unless an artist has some, in some way like intervened, interjected into it to create something new, to make it expressive. Um, Goldsworthy works with natural materials most of the time, and his work ranges really widely. So from the upper left, 
um, he found naturally forming icicles. Um, but of course, icicles just formed straight, right? So he took all these icicles, broke them into little pieces, and then refroze them by spitting on them, licking them, refroze them into place to create this spiral around a tree. Um, on the bottom right, this is actually a piece made in a lake. So what we're seeing is, if you kind of cut the circle in half, the upper part is actually an arrangement of sticks where he used um, natural fiber and, and leaves and sinew to uh, hold the sticks together. And the bottom half is actually the reflection across the water. So some of those pieces, those first two pieces, involve an incredible amount of skill and technique, but very non-traditional. So it's not the same skill as carving marble or painting an oil painting, um, but still a lot of uh, a lot of know-how of how to work with these materials, how to be incredibly patient with them, um, how long they'll hold still, all those things um, before they, they break down. And they do, most of his pieces only lasting maybe a few hours, a few days. This is probably the shortest lasting piece. Uh, maybe you can guess how he made it. He ran out in the sprinkling rain, laid down on the ground, and where he was laying, the stones stayed dry. And where he wasn't, of course, the rain was hitting the stones and turned them a darker color. So very um, minimal in skill and technique, you might say, but a very original, interesting concept. Um, it seems to speak about uh, kind of mortality and the fragility of life. It's just an image there for a moment and then gone. Um, in terms of materials too, I would say that today, um, in the 20th century and definitely today, any material um, is a possibility in art. So we're no longer um, limited to marble or bronze or oil paint, but any material as long as it adds meaning to the piece. So as an example of that, um, we might look at Janine Antony's Look and Lather in which she um, did portrait busts or portrait sculptures of herself in chocolate and in soap. And she did these, she was doing an exhibit for the Venice Biennale, um, this international art exhibit that happens in Venice every two years. And so she was going to this city where of course Renaissance sculpture, Renaissance art is uh, very uh, uh, supreme, you know, has been for generations. And so she wanted to do something related to the Renaissance but in a modern um, vernacular. And so she did these portraits of herself um, in chocolate and in soap, but also interacted with them. So you can kind of see in this close-up that she actually licked and gnawed on the chocolate. She actually washed and bathed with the soap. So she's interacting with her own self-portrait. And it's a commentary, at least in some ways, on how we interact with ourselves, um, I think as humans, but also maybe specifically as women, that we are um, hypercritical of ourselves and our appearance. Um, we We... Uh, you know, tend to look in the mirror and critique ourselves all the time. Um, but we also maybe are also prone to certain vanities or certain kind of obsessions with ourselves and how we look. So there's a sense of kind of nourishing herself with herself, eating on the chocolate, which is, of course, chocolate also can be symbolic of sort of an aphrodisiac or love, right? And the one on the right, the soap, um, can be symbolic of this search for purity um, in soap, um, for cleansing, for new life, all those things. Um, so choosing materials that add meaning to the artwork. Our last pair, the uh, Greek vase on the left versus the NPR logo mug. Um, if you were to go to a museum today, you might see um, these kind of beautiful Greek vases, um, which were utilitarian objects in their day. They were used to hold wine, and grain, other food. They were used in, in rituals or ceremonies. They were also, um, they're made with a lot of skill and technique. Um, the mug on the right, we wouldn't see in a museum today or an art gallery. We would see it in a souvenir shop or uh, a store. Um, we don't tend to look at it as having a lot of expression or originality. We know that they're mass produced in factories. And so for many of us, we might have said, well, the mug is just mass produced. It's a functional or utilitarian object. We usually don't think of utilitarian objects as fine art. Um, and that's all true. But what might surprise some of us is to think about how this vase was made, that it also was utilitarian in its day. And then it also, in a sense, was mass produced. Now, of course, this is before electricity and factories as we know them. But 
these vases were usually made in sort of a factory setting, a workshop setting, we would say, where there might be anywhere from 5 to 20 to 50 different artisans or craftspeople working together. One of them might make the basic shape of the vase, another might add the handles, another might add the foot of the, the vase, another would paint um, the black areas, and then another, kind of the most famous or most um, uh, celebrated artist, like Ezekias in this case, would be the one to paint the actual image in this um, register. So it is, in a sense, mass-produced or factory-made. They would be able to make a lot of these at once by kind of each person having a specialty. Um, why we consider it art, even though it is kind of factory-produced, as we've said, or a utilitarian object, is partially because of the time between their culture and ours, but also because in their culture they probably didn't distinguish between utilitarian forms and non-utilitarian forms. For the most part, before the Renaissance, most cultures tended to see painting and sculpture as in the same category as carpentry and ceramics work and stone laying. Any kind of manual labor was considered in one category. Nowadays, since the Renaissance, we tend to see a distinction between what we call the fine arts, which are made for contemplation, and the utilitarian arts or crafts. Um, in terms of that studio production, it's interesting to note that in the ancient world it was very common to have a studio assistance, a whole workshop of people working to create and collaborate on one object. Um, and that uh, workshop scenario has had a resurgence in the last you know, 50 years or so, where artists like these, so we've got Nick Cave, Jeff Coons, um, Andy Warhol over here, and Marilyn Minter, they're making so much work, they're making work, work on such a fast-paced scale uh, and such a large scale that they actually have to have assistance to keep up with it. So they might hire anywhere from a handful to you know a hundred or more assistants that are working for them making their pieces. They might not even lay a hand on a certain piece, but they have um, uh, come up with a concept for it, decided on all maybe the colors and the materials, etc and they give kind of the uh, oversee it being made. Um, so we're having a resurgence in that kind of a workshop scenario for making art. So here's our list. We're looking at, when we're talking about art, we're talking about man-made objects. Um, we're usually expecting a skill and technique to be present. Expression, either personal to the artist or of the culture. Originality of form, which means original looking, or original content, so in idea. Materials. In each culture, there have been certain materials that were deemed valid as art materials. Mass production has been an issue that has at some times been allowed and at some times been considered non-fine art. The artist's intent. So did the artist mean to make art and why and what were they trying to accomplish? The authority of the art world. So whoever is, is the authority of the art world, that they have sort of said, yes, this is art, this is worth our time and contemplation. And then utility or practical function. Since the Renaissance, we see fine arts, objects made from contemplation, as on opposite spectrum from, opposite end of the spectrum from utilitarian objects. Now, take a second to pause here and, just, and contemplate or write down what two or three of these core issues do you value the most? So when you're walking through a gallery, what's likely to stop you in your tracks? Are you trying to see, are you wanting to see new forms, originality of form, originality of content? Are you really interested in skill and technique or certain materials? So pause and reflect on that. Now, we've got this list of core issues in defining the concept of art, but what's important to recognize is that those core issues, even though a lot of cultures have kind of come back to those issues, each culture holds them in different priorities. So the concept of art has changed over time and between cultures, and we can use these core issues as a way to discuss those changes. If we look at the Renaissance in Western tradition, we're talking about around 1500, um, if you can kind of lock that down in your mind as a date, um, this tended to be what emerged in the Renaissance and has really highly affected our current view of art. So expression, um, at that time was still very cultural, so it wasn't just about the artist's feelings, but it took on a more personal expression than it had in the ancient world. 
So there's a mix of cultural and personal expression going on. Um, originality of form and content gained significance along with the artist's intent. So previously there had been cultures where the same art style and art ideas were popular for a couple hundred years, a couple thousand years. But in the Renaissance, we, we start to want to see more original forms. We want to see different artists um, do something new, something we haven't seen before, and give us a new idea from that as well. During the Renaissance, the artist, I, the idea of the artist changes. So the artist is no longer sort of a blue collar worker, um, no longer just a manual laborer, but becomes seen as a genius. Um, and in terms of personality, there's a stereotype of the artist as sort of melancholy and moody. Um, thanks a lot to someone like Michelangelo, um, but also of an elevated social status. Um, the artist's intent becomes really significant. Previously, before the Renaissance, we don't know many artists' names, actually. We don't know what they were thinking or why they made what they made. Was it just because they were paid to or were they really passionate about something? Um, but from the Renaissance forward, we know artists' names, we know more about their background, their training, and we, we tend to care more about that backstory. And because of those two things, after the Renaissance, we see the workshops decrease. So um, certain artists like Raphael still had a workshop, even Rembrandt in the 1600s had a workshop of people working for him, but Michelangelo chose not to. Um, and kind of following that example, for over the next several hundred years, it became more and more important that artists make their own work and use fewer and fewer assistants, or only use assistants for kind of maybe stretching the canvases, preparing the marble, sharpening the tools, but not actually making the work. So that's interesting. Um, mass production via the workshop that's losing esteem, and utility we have in the Renaissance that separation of fine arts from crafts. Well, just one simple example of that would be looking at Michelangelo's Pietà, very famous piece which he, of course, exhibits incredible skill and technique, making this piece of stone look like a body, look like veins and bones underneath the skin, look like this amazing fabric. Um, it's interesting to know it's not totally original in content in the, in the idea that, or, or in form, in the sense that he's not the first to sculpt the Pietà. Uh, many other artists, like this one at the left, German artist, um, sculpted this theme, you know, and many other biblical themes were very often produced during this time, the medieval into the Renaissance period, yet he did it in a different way, and he actually made the figure of the Virgin Mary a little younger than other artists had tend to, uh, tended to, and, um, and he just described the body of Christ in a much more anatomically specific way, so you can actually see his ribs, you can actually see Mary's fingers kind of um, folding into his skin there. So, not completely brand new theme, but an original interpretation of it. Um, yeah, so it's a good example of some of those Renaissance values. What about today? Today in our culture in 20th century, originality of form and content are probably the most highly valued. We want to see new things and be told new things. Materials and technique, anything goes. Um, you might be working in chocolate and soap or toothpaste or blood. You might be sculpting in marble, painting in oil. Anything in it goes as long as it adds meaning to the work. So artists are expected to choose thoughtfully. Why are you working in marble? Why are you taking a photograph, etc. Because of that, of course, skill and technique vary widely. Um, the expression could be a range of cultural to personal. So we no longer have um, such unity in terms of maybe religious or political ideas, right? When you look at Renaissance work, you know, a huge percentage of it is, of course, um, Christian themes or Christian literary themes and Christian heroes. Of course, nowadays we have such a wide range of different beliefs, different um, religions happening in the same place that we don't have as unified of a cultural expression. Um, but we still do have artists trying to talk maybe about religion and politics, maybe about kind of cultural fabric who are we as Americans, who are we as, you know, world citizens, and then also personal stories, personal experiences. We mentioned the resurgence of the workshop in terms of mass production. Um, and also we could say with mass production, it might not just be having studio assistants and such. We also have artworks that are actually made in factories that could be, ju be just ordered from a factory, but still there's something about the artist choosing to display it as an artwork with their artistic intent that um, makes it an artwork. The authorities of the art world in this day 
are patrons and collectors, so people who are buying art um, get to establish the trends and what's popular and what's not. Um, they get to sort of make and break artist careers, right? Um, of course, museums and galleries are also um, great tastemakers, um, really important in the life of an artist. Um, utility and uh, utilitarian uh, issues as well, the separation of fine arts from crafts still continues. So this is why we can see such a huge range of different artworks today. Um, it's not really surprising when you think of that as um, our kind of concept of art. Now I want to remind us that the changing priorities in the fine arts are always connected to culture. They always reflect what's happening in culture. So whenever you're looking at artworks, ask yourself, how does this relate to cultural standards, to cultural ideals? Even if it seems remote, there's always some connection there. Art does not happen in a vacuum. Um, so what did our ancient artisans and artists think of art? As we're studying, I want you guys to continue to, to question what is the concept of art in prehistoric and ancient cultures? How do they prioritize the core issues? And just some very, very general ideas here. Skill and technique tended to be highly prioritized but very narrowly defined. So what you could call art in Egypt was very specific or in Rome, very specific. The expression tended not to be about the artist's life but about the cultural um, expression. Uh, materials were limited in availability, right? They didn't have the options we do today, but and also very limited validity. So certain stones, certain types of technique. Um, mass production occurred in workshops. The power in the art world were really the royalty or ruling classes and religious figures tended to be the people that paid for the most art, commissioned the most pieces. And we saw fine arts and crafts usually as one group. What things were not prioritized, it really, most cultures didn't care much for originality of form and content. They sort of established a style and wanted to continue it. And generally, the artist's intent was not very important. The artist was seen as a day laborer or a blue collar worker. So we don't know the names of many ancient artists or, or even artists from Greek, uh, Greece and Rome, etc. These are two good, great examples of artworks um, that uh, were made in those traditions to be a cultural ex expression and not a personal one. It wasn't about the artist and what they felt that day. It was about what was needed and wanted in their cultures. I want to add just three more overarching questions to us and write these down because as you're reading in each chapter I want you to ask yourself these three questions. What was their concept of art? So you can reference the core issues from that characteristic, what are characteristic subjects and contents? That also gives you a hint about what they thought was valid um, expression, what was important to say. Who is patronizing the art? Who's funding it? Who's prescribing it? It's like saying what it should look like and why. And then how and where was art experienced? That's important too. Was it open to the public or was it hidden behind closed doors? Um, how did you access art in that world? So what was their concept of art? A second question to keep asking was what was their idea of the artist? Um, what degree of freedom of form and content did the artist have? Were they just working by commission? Were they told what to express? Um, or were they allowed to create their own forms, their own content? Was the artist a genius, a manual laborer, a spiritual guy? Was he a PR specialist? Was he just kind of doing propaganda for the empire, let's say? Um, how celebrated or famed did artists become? Do we know the individual artist's intent or was it really about this bigger system? And lastly, what was the function of the studio? So how did the studio work? Was it uh, a place for the individual artist to work and to be inspired? Was it about inspiration? Was the artist there with assistance? Was it an egalitarian team? So a team of workers that were all equally paid, equally prioritized. Was it a space for artistic in, in, uh, sorry, introspection? Was it a sacred space for transcendent rituals? So these are just examples, but every chapter you read, try to answer these three questions. What is the concept of art? What was their idea of the artist? And what was the function of the studio? Right. And I'll ask you some of those questions in our quizzes and certainly in our, our exams as well. All right, we'll end here. Thank you guys.